PRI Public Radio International. There are thousands of species at risk of extinction, some of them highly endangered, and it may seem like an impossible task to protect them. But guess what? The fact is we're actually pretty good at conservation. When we care about an animal, we can protect it. But it's only the rare creature that somehow captures imaginations and inspires incredible efforts. The creepy and strikingly ugly California condor, the peregrine falcon. We've been amazingly successful with critters like the Lear's macaw. And, of course, the humpback whale. Over the past few decades, the humpback whale population has gone from 5,000 to about 80,000. That is successful conservation, my friends. But what about the losers in this popularity contest? What about the animals that can't seem to get off the extinction list? The beluga sturgeon, the hawksbill turtle, the mako shark. A new study finds that while conservation has failed to preserve some species, like Costa Rica's golden toad, others are winning and winning big. Joining us today to explain, Dr. Doug Inkley. He's the senior wildlife biologist at the National Wildlife Federation. Good morning. Good morning, Celeste. Well, there's there's officials from about 200 countries actually gathered in Japan as we speak, as I understand, trying to set some new goals uh, in, in conservation, goals aiming at what they can achieve by the year 2020. But coming out of it is this study saying that one out of every five vertebrates, mammals, reptiles, amphibians, are actually in danger of extinction. How long is that timeline? Well, these species are in danger of extinction right now. We're talking about about one-fifth of the world's species. So this is a very significant problem that uh, this recent study that you referenced uh, has taken a very close look at. Some 150 scientific experts from around the world uh, did this comprehensive study of about 25,000 different species and came to the conclusion that while a fifth of them are indeed threatened, when we put our minds to it, we can, in fact, conserve these species. And you've already listed a few examples. The peregrine falcon uh, is one of them, and so is the humpback whale. Well, well, then what we don't need is new ideas on how to conserve. What we need is, is new ideas on how to motivate conservation. Is, is that right? Well, what we learned from this study is that you're exactly right. What we need to do is to put in place long-term efforts. Those are the ones that work. We need to address the primary cause of the problem, why the species is declining. When we do that, it works. And we also need to fund these programs. That works. If we simply list the species as threatened or endangered, it's not going to help the species unless we actually take significant conservation efforts. Okay, but explain, give me a a concrete example. I mean, let's take the humpback whale, for example. What makes the difference? Is it that the public buys in, that they they become concerned about a particular animal? I think that public buy-in is extremely important, and people from around the world have indicated that they're very interested in conservation of what we sometimes call the charismatic megafauna, like whales. But people have a pretty good ecological understanding that we also have to conserve the little species that maybe you and I have never heard about, but they're an important part of our ecosystem. The panda is still one of the most endangered species. I mean, you'd think you'd get public buy-in on the panda. Well, you think that you would, but that is an indication of one of the significant problems in recovering species. When it is habitat loss, which is the primary cause, which is the case for most species, that is the most challenging type of cause of endangerment to reverse. Well, but that uh, raises a philosophical question. Just because you have pandas in zoos doesn't mean they're preserved, I, I, I guess. And, and how do you preserve a species, say, in the canopy in the jungles of uh, Brazil, where global warming is is raising the temperature at particular areas in the canopy where, uh, you know, the timing of mating is completely thrown off. I mean, that that's a, a complexity that it's pretty difficult to address with a few um, marketing campaigns. Yes, John, it is, it is extremely complex. In that particular case, what has to be done is the conservation or preservation of the habitat that these species require, and in this case, the addressing of the issue of global warming, because global warming is a pervasive problem that if we don't address it, it will continue continue to affect habitats worldwide. So maybe some of the, the species on these, these great stories of conservation, the gray wolf and the black-footed ferret, maybe they were just had the easier problems to solve. Some 
some of them did have easier problems to solve. Let me give you an example. Uh, invasive species is a problem, especially for pelagic or ocean-going birds that nest on islands. Unfortunately, mankind has introduced uh, feral cats and rats and red foxes, none of which belong on these islands, and which are terribly devastating to the nesting populations of these bird species. When we remove those invasive species from those islands, we have remarkable success in recovering the species. But, you know, the, th the, the thing that which complicates this even more is that each of these species, they're, they're not acting independently. You save one, and that has a ripple effect on, on another species, perhaps positive. One, like the golden toad, goes extinct in Costa Rica, and that's going to have a ripple effect. Is that rel relatively accurate? Yes, that's very accurate, Celeste, because what happens is if you protect the habitat for one species, like the golden toad, by default, you're probably protecting the habitat for many other species which could also be in trouble. How do you, it all how, goes back to conservation of habitat. But how do you separate the species that are bound to go extinct, because extinctions are natural, and ones which are preventable? Well, so, uh, that's a, that's a million-dollar question, and I don't think anyone has the exact answer to that. But the fact of the matter is that with the development uh, we've done in modern civilization, we have greatly accelerated the natural rate of extinction far beyond what we've seen uh, in recent times. And I don't know that I or anyone else can tell you exactly which species should naturally go extinct versus what we're causing to go extinct. The fact of the matter is we need to try to conserve most of them because they're important to the services that are provided to humans, whether it's medicine or clean water and the habitats that are protected or timber from the forest that are protected, etc. They're all important to mankind. But do you micro-prioritize? Do you go down and say, this is the most endangered species, we have to protect this one first? Or do you then set that aside and just say, look, we need to solve global warming? Well, in, in ecosystem conservation or species conservation, we've been seeing a shift. Historically, we have focused on individual species. But more and more now, we're trying to focus on ecosystems or habitats, recognizing that if we can preserve significant areas for these species to live, we can pay less attention to the individual species and just protect their habitat, and they'll do fine on their own. Give them a chance. Dr. Doug Inkley is a senior wildlife biologist, National Wildlife Federation. Uh, Dr. Inkley, can you tell us one species you think just is completely unnoticed? Uh, a species that can is completely unnoticed to most humans is probably the furbush lousewort, a terrible name for a species. Who could care about it? But yet it's one of the many millions of species that are so important to all of us. I'll, I'll trade the lousewarts for all the mosquitoes on planet Earth. <laughs> I don't, I don't think you can make that trade. Thank you I'm very ready. thank you very much. <laughs> thank you.